Well, good morning. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 12 this morning. Let's all stand in honor of reading God's Word, Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. And we'll read down through verse 32. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. And all the crowds were amazed and were saying, This man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man cast out demons only by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. And knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebub, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we pray that you would help us to see the truth and the depth of your word. Lord, we pray that your Spirit would teach us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this is the last sermon in this series of Radical, and it really comes down to this question. What will you do with Jesus? Now, I know that many of you have already made that decision. You've already made your decision what you have done with Jesus. You have trusted him as your personal Lord and Savior. You have come to the uh, to the conviction, because you've seen the truth, the evidence is clear. This is God's Son. This is the Savior of the world. Jesus did die on a cross, and he died on a cross for me. And in simple faith, I'm going to believe that, and I'm going to trust that. And so what you've done with Jesus is you have accepted him. You have invited him into your life, into your heart, to be your Savior, but also to be your Lord. But the question still remains, perhaps there are some here this morning who are still struggling with what to do with this man called Jesus. What will you do with Jesus? You know, we've gone through this series, we've looked at the Sermon on the Mount and all that Jesus has done and all that he has said, the eyewitness accounts, the, the authoritative preaching, the authenticating preaching that he has amazed and awestruck the people who have heard him preach, the miracles that he performed, his ministry, the call to repentance, the call to be in his kingdom. What will you do with Jesus? There's really only two options. You can believe and follow, or you can reject and ignore. You can believe and follow. You know what's interesting to me is as the Lord is preaching and as his ministry begins to grow, multitudes of people are gathering and they're all hearing the same truth and yet for some it's hardening their hearts and for others it's just melting their hearts away that they are really beginning to see and beginning to understand could this be the son of David as is shared in this passage could this be the Messiah that we have waited so long for well, one of the things that we see in this passage that is very clear, there are those who believe and followed after the Lord from that day, and there are those who from that day began to reject everything that Christ stood for. And not only did they reject him, but they were very aggressive trying to kill him and do away with him. In our passage, we see this conflict 
between the Lord Jesus Christ and the religious leaders of his day as it begins to intensify to the point that the religious leaders come to a, a decision in their hearts to reject Jesus as the Messiah. Now we know that because the Lord has performed this miracle and they hear the crowd saying, could this be the son of David? And immediately the Pharisees jump in and what do they say? This man cast out demons by Beelzebub. In other words, what he was doing was by the power of Satan, not by the power of God. In their hearts, they have chosen to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about all that he has said and done up to this point. And there, there are those who would believe and follow, and there are those who would reject and ignore, and it's the same way. It has always been the same way, even to today, as we hear the truth. If you are here this morning, and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, maybe you're struggling with who this Jesus is, you have a decision to make. Will I believe and follow, or will I reject and ignore and write off? But we need to understand that the Lord gives this warning to them and what that warning would mean to them and also what that warning would mean to us. But let's look at the encounter first because we see the Lord's miracle. The Lord performs this miracle and immediately the Pharisees throw out this accusation. Isn't it interesting that every time, and even today, think about this in your own life, any time truth is spoken, immediately someone says a lie. As soon as the truth is spoken, someone opposes that truth with lies. It doesn't matter what forum you're in, what, it doesn't matter. When truth is spoken, there's always that counter truth, that, that lie, that falsehood, that perversion that comes in and tries to throw people off. The Lord's miracle and the Pharisees' accusation. We see there in verse 22 and 23, Jesus healed this man who was blind and mute because he was possessed by a demon. And the people saw what Christ did and they were amazed and they wondered if this could be the son of David. They saw the deliverance. They saw the healing of this man as proof that this was the Messiah. See, all along... The, the, the claims that Christ is making and how he has been confronting the, the, the religious leaders of the day and their teaching and how his teaching was more authoritative and the crowds were awestruck and were amazed at the authority with which he spoke and taught. They saw this deliverance and they saw this healing as proof that Jesus was the Messiah. And the indication is that some there believed on Jesus and acknowledged him as the Messiah, as the result. And as soon as the Pharisees heard this, what did they do? They began to reject him. Began to divert the people, trying to persuade. Now, Christ has been persuading the people all along with his teaching, with his miracles, and all of the things that he has been doing. And the people are becoming more and more convinced that this is the son of David. This is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. But the Pharisees heard and they see what's going on and they hear that the people are, are beginning to be convinced and they began to reject Christ. They say he cast out the demons by the authority and the power of Beelzebub, reference to Satan, the Lord of the Flies. They were trying to turn the people against Jesus by claiming that his miracles were empowered by Satan himself. Truth is always confronted with lies. The truth is always confronted with lies. We see secondly in verse 25 through 27, the Lord responds. And not only does he respond to the lie, but then he makes this declaration of truth again. He's already performed this miracle, and the evidence is clear, and the people are proclaiming, could this be the son of David? And the Pharisees interject this, this false claim, and so the Lord responds to them. He confronts this lie, and he says there, he, he gives this simple, common-sense answer to the claim that the Pharisees are making. And he says there, any kingdom... Any city, any household that is divided against itself will surely fall. 
How is it then that I can be doing this in the name of Satan? This would be true of Satan's kingdom as well. For the prince of demons to cast out his own demons didn't make sense. I mean, it just doesn't make sense that he would be doing that. So if Jesus cast out demons, he would not... He could not be working for Satan because then that would be a house divided against itself. Jesus further then insisted that if his work was empowered by Satan, then Satan must also be empowering the efforts to deliver the demon possessed. So he makes this response, he he confronts the lies, and then he offers another truth statement. For he says there in verse 26, if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself, how then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebub, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. Jesus says that the work he did was by the Holy Spirit, not by Satan. The work that Jesus was doing was by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you go and you look at Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 11, verse 20, we're told that Jesus also said he cast out demons by the finger of God. Now you have to go all the way back to Exodus when Moses is performing these miracles in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh's uh, magicians could do some of the same things, but when it went beyond what even they could do, They would say, well, it's it's the finger of God. Jesus said it is the finger of God. This is God's work, not Satan's work. Jesus said the way he cast out demons was superior to the way that the Pharisees were trying to cast out demons because when demons heard the command of the Lord Jesus Christ, immediately they left. It wasn't because of some ceremony or some ritual. He just simply spoke the words and he made the command and the demons left. Authority. Not only did they leave, but the demons left and they stayed gone. They didn't come back. Jesus spoke of how demons would return to a previous home when they found it unoccupied, but When he cast out demons, they stayed out because Christ was now master of the house. He is the stronger man who binds the strong man and takes over the house. Verse 29 says, Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? Christ is the stronger man. And Christ has bound Satan. He is the stronger man. Then we see in verse 30, the Lord's call and the warning. In light of the clear revelation given by God, Christ issued this call, and this call rings out true today. Verse 30, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. Now, think about that in the context of what's going on. Jesus is preaching the truth, and people are seeing the miracles, and they're hearing the the preaching with the great authority, and people are beginning to see this is the Messiah. But what do the religious leaders do? They begin to scatter the people with their lies. Christ is trying to gather the children of Israel with the truth, and here these Pharisees come in, and they begin to scatter the people with their lies. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. It's a call, and it's really, the call is twofold. One is a call to be with him. You're either with Christ or you're not. And to be with Christ is this call to a personal relationship with him. He is calling us to to be with him, to commit to a personal relationship with the God of the universe who has revealed himself in these latter days through the person of Jesus Christ. 
It's a call to a personal relationship, but it's also more than that. It's a call to a purposeful relationship because he says, not only do you need to be with me, but what's the opposite of scattering? Gathering. What does the Great Commission say that we are to do? Go and make disciples of all nations. That's gathering. That's sharing the truth and gathering in people to faith. To join him in drawing others to a personal love relationship with God through faith in him. And so there is that call in verse 30. But when you see verse 31 and 32, there's a warning. And the warning rings true today. He says there, therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. But blasphemy against the spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. One might reject the Son, but later on, if their heart was still sensitive to the call of the Spirit, and they consider it further, and they repent, they could be forgiven. But what the Lord is saying here, we need to understand what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is this state of hardness in the heart in which one consciously and willfully resists God's saving power and grace. And the Lord says there comes a time when that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that willful, conscious resistance of God's saving power and grace falls on a deaf ear. The warning is very clear. But it is the Spirit of God that makes us aware of God's revelation. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and following, we, we, we began to see that the things of God are spiritually discerned. And it is the indwelling Holy Spirit that helps us to understand the depths and the truth of God's Word. And apart from that, man cannot fully understand who God is unless the Spirit of God indwells them. So it is the Spirit of God that that makes us aware of God's revelation. And it is the Spirit of God that convicts and woos us and draws us to Him. How does He do that? The same way Jesus was doing. He was preaching. He was proclaiming the truth. Some heard the truth and believed, others rejected the truth. The same is true today. The Pharisees' rejection of God's revelation of himself through Christ brought them to a point of no return. They crossed a line, their hearts were so hardened against the work of the Spirit, they were beyond conversion. One can't afford to presume upon the grace of God. If you reject Christ today, there's no guarantee that your heart will be responsive enough to accept him tomorrow. Now, I don't know how hard your heart has to be. I don't know how much rejection there has to be. But the Bible says, blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Don't willfully harden your heart as you hear the truth. When you hear the truth, when you hear Scripture, when you you read about the life of Christ and you see the miracles and you see the testimony and you read about the, the eyewitness accounts of his resurrection and you hear about the miracles, does that soften your heart or does that harden your heart? Is Jesus who he says he is? Does the evidence convince you, or do you need more evidence? What will you do with Jesus? And the thing is, it's not just a one-time event. Yes, there's a time where you have to make a decision that I'm going to trust Christ for my salvation. But really, it is a take up your cross daily and follow after me. See, it's what will you do with Jesus at the point of conversion, but it's also what will you do with Jesus every moment of every day? Are you going to trust him? 
when the storms of life are raging? Are you going to rest in him when there is no rest to be found anywhere else? Is he God? Is he the Savior? Is he Lord? What will you do with Jesus? Now I want to change gears just a little bit because I want, I want to share some things with you how God has revealed himself in Scripture but even outside of Scripture. What about through creation? Through creation, we learn about the power of God, whether we look through a microscope or we look through a telescope. The creation displays the handiwork of God. Think about looking through a microscope, and the microscope says design points to an intelligent designer. The evidence is there. To grasp the reality of life, this is Michael Denton, who is an atheist. He's a biologist. And I, it's interesting, when you read some of these things that atheists say, they're, in their statements, they confirm what the Bible already declares. They just don't know it. He says, to grasp the reality of life as revealed by a molecular biology, we must magnify a cell, listen to this, a thousand million times until it resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. And what would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface, we would see millions of openings like portholes of a vast spaceship opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If we were to enter one of these, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. It, is it really credible that random processes could have constructed a reality the smallest element of which a functional protein or a gene is complex beyond our own creative capabilities, a reality which is the very antithesis of change, which excels in every sense anything produced by man. So we can look through the microscope and we can magnify something a thousand million times. In the inner workings of that cell, the complexity, the design points to a designer. Well, what if we were to not look at the micro, but look out into the vastness of space through a telescope? Scientists contend that there are some 200 different parameters that all have to be true in order for life to exist on this planet. Professor of philosophy at Messiah College in Pennsylvania says this, one could think of each instance of fine-tuning as a radio dial. Unless all the dials are set exactly right, life would be impossible. The fact that the dials are perfectly set strongly suggests that someone set the dials. For it seems erroneously improbable that such a coincidence could happen by chance. Creation reveals God. But it is the Bible that we learn his name. It is the Bible that we learn of his providential care. It is the Bible that we learn about who he is and how he woos us and draws us to himself. When you look at the preservation of the Bible, when you look at the historical accuracy of the Bible, and you see all of these things coming to place. When you think, think about the preservation of the Bible, Thousands upon thousands of manuscripts through, throughout the centuries. And even with the, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls just a few decades ago, all of this confirms the authenticity of Scripture. An archaeologist talking about the historical accuracy of the Bible says this, no archaeological discovery has ever con controverted a single biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or exact detail historical statements in the Bible. 
And by the same token, proper evaluation of biblical descriptions have often led to amazing discoveries. One of the other things that is tremendous about how God has revealed himself is in the consistency and the theme throughout Scripture. Composed of 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors using several languages. It's amazing. And then finally, the writer of Hebrews tells us that in many ways, various forms, God has revealed himself to the prophets. But in these last days, he has revealed himself perfectly in his son. Through Jesus Christ, we learn about the purpose of God. There is purpose. God entered into this world in the person of Christ to make known to us what we could never know on our own. That's why it's God's revelation to us. What will you do with Jesus? There's a call to come, but there's also a call to go. You have to come to Christ, come in simple faith, trusting in him, trusting in what Jesus Christ has done on Calvary's cross. And then when you come to him, you give your life to him, and now you'll go for him. Being a disciple and going and making disciples. That's what the Christian faith is all about a personal relationship, but also a purposeful relationship. Finally, there is the victory. In this passage, some of the things that really stood out to me that were amazing in terms of the victory that we can have in the Lord Jesus Christ are spelled out. He says there in verse 29, Jesus has overcome Satan, the weaker one, verse 29. He has overcome Satan. Not only has he overcome Satan, but we know through other passages of Scripture, he has overcome sin and death and the grave. And because of that, when we put our faith and trust in him, we rest in what he's already done. Not only that, but not only has he overtaken and overcome Satan, but Jesus has taken Satan's weapons. Listen to what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2. When he had disarmed the rulers and the authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Colossians 2.15. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 through 23. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, and power, and dominion. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. Now, if that's not victory, I don't know what victory is. What are you going to do with Jesus? We sing a song Victory in Jesus. Jesus not only provides the victory, he is the victory. He is the victor. He has overcome everything that could separate you from God. My prayer and my concern this morning is that you would trust, that you would make a decision to believe. That the evidence is overwhelming that Jesus is who he says he is. Don't reject him. Don't ignore him any longer. Well, Pastor, I'll take care of that later. I'll take care of that next week. Listen, you don't have the, you don't have the promise of five minutes from now. Today is the day of salvation. Right now, don't put it off. 
Would you bow your heads with me as we respond to God's word this morning? The invitation is always there. God is so faithful. God is so patient with us. And he continues to hold out his arms and call us even though as a people we're rebellious, we're hard-headed, we're stiff-necked. Lord, I pray that you would soften hearts this morning. Even as believers, as we sit here today, Lord, I pray that you would soften our heart, that we would see that we have been called for a purpose. And that purpose is to lead others to Christ. Lord, I pray that your will would be done. Help each one of us respond in the way that we need to this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.